This is a brand new dance talk series that is led by our dancers. So we're really excited to be able to share this with you tonight. Um, tonight's topic is going to be choreography and the creative process. And it's going to be led by our principal dancer, Ian Cassidy. Um, we're so glad to see you all in this digital format. Um, you know, we can't see you in person right now, but this is a great way for us to connect and, and be able to share um, just some insight into this art form that we love so much. A few uh, notes um, just about how this evening's going to go. So Ian is going to lead some discussion with our panel. Um, he may also answer some of the questions that we got previously submitted from you. At any time during our discussion, if you'd like to send a question over the chat feature, um, we'll see if we can answer a few of those at the end of the discussion tonight as well. A few Zoom notes. Uh, please go ahead and keep your microphone muted during tonight's discussion. It really helps with any background noise and interference, and so everybody can hear the panelists um, loud and clear. Uh, you're welcome to turn your video on. We love to see your faces uh, um, during this discussion. And then also in the top right-hand corner of your screen, there's the option to switch either to speaker view or gallery view. So check that out and see which one you prefer. I think those are uh, my just housekeeping notes and just an overview of tonight's discussion. But without further ado, I'd like to pass it on over to Ian Caskey and he'll introduce tonight's panel. Thank you, Kelly. Hi, everybody. Welcome. Thank you so much for coming. Um, I'll go ahead and introduce the panel, even though I don't think I really need to introduce them. Uh, so we have uh, Connor Walsh, Oliver Halkowicz, and Melody Minetti all uh, veteran dancers of the company and all happen to also be choreographers. So um, let me just get started here. Um, let me ask you all, uh, have you always been interested in, in choreographing or uh, when did you know that you wanted to start choreographing? Uh, Connor, let's start with you. So you're right there. Oh gosh. Um, I don't know when the urge really started, more of a recent thing, more in my professional life. Um, but I realized now looking back at my childhood that my mother choreographed a tremendous amount and I was, she was a dance teacher as well as a choreographer. And so I was, um, surrounded by creativity and she collaborated with lots of great people in our community. And, um, and I, I it's not until kind of later in life now that I'm starting to try and make my own stuff here and there that I realized that, that there's something that's been it's been part of my life in many ways for a very long time. Um, but I personally didn't jump in there until, until I was probably in my 20s. It took me a while to kind of work up the courage or even consider that I had any um, possibility to do so. Yeah. You didn't think when you were training as a student that you might want to try it sometime? Or? No way. I mean, dance was terrifying and hard enough as it was. I yeah. <laughs> it was. Um, you know, I just think it took a while for me to have the headspace to even consider it. I think I was so um, hyper focused uh, right. on on dancing, and um, the academy has great opportunities where they, you know, students can choreograph, and I never dared raise my hand for that. Um, yeah, I, sure. I wish I would have, because it probably would be an easier process for me now if I got comfortable then. But um, no, I mean, it wasn't until later that I started to be a part of so many choreographic processes with other choreographers and saw how many ways there are to create dances that I was like, oh, there's not one way or mm -hmm. it's not natural for everybody or, you know, like everybody has sure. their own process and maybe I can figure one out for myself. Cool. Very cool. What about you, Oliver? A lot on, yeah, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's good. <laughs> All good. Um, I'm going to say what the question was... <laughs> Connor spoke so long that I forgot. <laughs> um, have you? No, I yeah, have. I, you always been interested in it? I I was not. Um, no. And I don't know why. Like when Connor was talking about the school, that made me think about. Um, I went to a summer program at Pittsburgh Ballet Theater, and we had to do these sort of like groupings where I think we like got like a group of five and choreographed to Pachelbel's Canon or something like that. But I mean, that's the only. And that was only just jarred now. Um, but I had no interest and I, I, I don't know why. Um, although I did, I did choreograph like on my kind of diving friends. I was a diver and I would like go to their house and make dances to Janet Jackson, but who didn't? Um, but 
<laughs> I, don't, I don't know. I think I just wanted to be a dancer and I didn't um, think I had any sort of voice in choreography. And it was our choreographic workshop in whenever that was in 2010 or 2000. Was it that long ago? Really? It was when we moved into the building. Into the new building, yeah. And, um, 2011. and that's when I think I was um, brave enough for myself to, to try it out. Hmm. That's funny. I, I, maybe it's because of all your um, uh, dances on Instagram and stuff, but I kind of picture you having always done stuff like that, even as a kid. I, yeah, I, don't, I just, I, didn't, I remember it like, as you can tell, I'm very rojo because I've been laying out of the pool. I'm in Florida. I've always liked to lay out of the pool and I've always liked to choreograph in my head laying at the pool. So that, that was something I did as a kid. <laughs> that was the extent of my choreography. That's, That's as far as um, I went. I don't, I don't know. I don't know why I didn't. I just, I, I thought other people did it better. I still do. <laughs> but, um, <laughs> but now I like doing it. Yeah. Well, I think too, like Connor said, you know, sometimes when you're so super focused on one thing, it doesn't even really occur to you that you might, you know. And there's, there's also something about I didn't, I wasn't ready to use my voice to tell people what I, what I wanted, what I thought, and, you know, I was very much, I used my body to, um, to, to kind of be myself, and I wasn't ready to, to say it, um, right. so that's been, been a kind of thing. Hmm. Interesting. What about you, Maddie? Um, so I started training ballet when I was nine, and so I might have been nine and a half, um, and we knew this lady who, <laughs> who uh, she like headed up this like performance troupe and they did dance kind of around town in a different way, but, but we, she was like a friend of the family. So I was determined to make a dance and show it to her. And because my dad listened to a lot of classical music, uh, funny enough because he had really bad, bad anxiety when I was growing up. And so he like went through this phase of like all this classical music to calm his mind and do this stuff. And so there was this one piece of music and I, I need to go back and figure out what it is, but it was like Tchaikovsky or Mozart or something. And it was one and a half minutes long and it was very exciting. And so I literally like, I had been in ballet for like six months and I went in and I showed the woman of this, like the leader of this troupe, my dance. And I literally like, Torchetted because I had learned to torchetted, or I had watched someone do it for a minute and a half. I was like, torchetted, torchetted. Hey, torchete. why not? I mean, kind of impressive to think of that now. Yeah. <laughs> at, the, at, the, at the moment, sure. <laughs> <laughs> I haven't done a torchetted um, in eight weeks, it, so. <laughs> yeah, they they never did my piece, but at the end of it, she gave me my first feedback, and she said maybe do another one when you learn some more steps. <laughs> and so I think it's funny because I still don't think I put enough steps in my pieces, um, but I do more than just four to days now, I guess. Yes, yes, so you do. That was the first time I choreographed. Cool, very good. <laughs> um, well, let me ask you all too, uh, so as far as being a dancer and a choreographer, you know, as a professional dancer, we're used to switching from you know one ballet to another many times in the course of a day but what is it like switching from dancing to choreographing maybe back again you know from one hour to the next how does that how do you switch your brain like that i'll let somebody else go first sure. yeah go for it i will um i'll say i'll talk um I think the hardest thing is not <laughs> if you're a dancer and, an, uh, the, and you're learning choreography, you're doing choreography, it's hard not to go into the next rehearsal where you are the choreographer and not do the choreography that you just were learning as the dancer. Right, right. <laughs> That's the hardest thing. So those moves um, seep in and then you... Yeah, every, every dance I've ever made looks like the choreography I was doing at the time <laughs> as a dancer. I don't know if that's true. I have to say something about that really fast because just this week I was like, what just happened? I posted something on Instagram and it was just like improvisation. And this other totally different genre of dancer in Houston commented on it and was like, you just faced so many different directions and put all these emojis. A week later, he did improvisation and posted it on Instagram and it was all different directions. 
<laughs> with the emojis and I was like, that's not on purpose. That's just what happens. Like we see something and it goes somewhere and then we're like, ooh, it my body's your brain, yeah. Thing. Yeah. So I think that's really a thing for everybody. I'm sure, yeah. Definitely I think inspiration I, comes in all kinds of different different directions, right? I think I mean, I find that one of the most challenging parts about, you know, what Melody and Oliver and I are trying to do these days is like when you're trying to create something, you, you need to, re it takes a tremendous amount of focus and time and commitment, you know, and, and sometimes in a rehearsal day, when we've gotten to work stuff, we're jumping from one thing to the next. And then you walk into a room of dancers who are eager and they're like interested to help you out. And you're like, well, can I have a couple more minutes? Like I, you know, just so you can collect yourself emotionally, uh, remember what you've prepared for them. I mean, I find that part so, difficult you know I, I envy the choreographers who have committed themselves and um they can walk into a rehearsal completely prepared as prepared as anyone can be you know um but also emotionally and 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 be so present and not feel uh scattered but i also fear that when i won't when i'm not dancing other pieces when, when i'm not absorbing material that i won't have any material to put out <laughs> you know, like, like like everything that i i have to bring to the table is things that i've absorbed and and so i worry that when i'm not absorbing anymore like what <laughs> how to continue creating things so You're i really come out yeah i really admire choreographers you can create for long for decades i think that that's so, that's so incredible but don't you think their choreography changes once they stop dancing absolutely whether it becomes more theatrical or a different you know like because you can't your body you know it's it's a language it's how you know how to speak you know it's um so yeah, I'm afraid for the day that I'm no longer dancing somebody else's ballet and just trying things out in the studio and then I have to go in by myself. Yeah. <laughs> that's lovely in here. <laughs> yeah. So you think that's the hardest part then of being a, a dancer and a choreographer at the same time? I, I mean, I think time is the hardest part for me personally. Just, you know, the trying to juggle the, the workload is, is, is difficult, but I think it's when pe pe the people who are successful, the people who really want it, and when you really want something, you make the time, you know? That's what, I, I mean, when I've witnessed, like uh, watching Garrett Smith when he was young in the choreography, and now Oliver and Melody, like when you see people really commit to it, they want, it's, it's when they want it. They make the time, they find the time, they find the extra minutes in the day to, I remember walk walking in class and just seeing Oliver stuck staring out the window while he was <laughs> his piece, and I just knew like, he is just working, he's trying to grab every minute of free time and you're just staring, trying to prepare and, and think and create and um, that's so hard. Yeah, I mean, a great, a great time to come up with choreography and um, think about what you're gonna do in rehearsal is at the bar in class in the morning. <laughs> I mean, Melody can attest, like when I was making um, my ballet earlier in the season, it was like a lot of the time it was just staring off at the bar, didn't get any of the combinations. <laughs> I was gonna say, yeah. But maybe I came up with steps for my, you know, hour down the down the road that day. Yeah, yeah. I think it's it's like Connor saying, it's just the balance is the hardest of like of energy, you know, because it takes so much energy and like Connor said too, commitment and focus in to be a dancer obviously and so our work day is centered with so much mental energy too not just physical energy and then i find choreographing exhausting like i i don't know because you're often speaking and moving and thinking and there's so many there's so many hours outside of it which there is in dancing too but when you add it all together it's just a lot of energy um yeah. yeah. Well, and that's the other part of it too, is just the, the act of standing in the front of the room and, and directing other people, telling them what to do instead of <clears throat> receiving the information as a dancer and, you know, getting direction all the time. And that takes a right. lot of there, mental energy. I remember, I, it might have been Amy. No, I don't know if it was Amy. Somebody who was like new, more newly transitioned out from the company into a staff position teaching class. Maybe it was you, Ian. I don't remember. It been... Someone recently who was like teaching one of their earlier classes uh -huh. was like, I can't breathe. Out of like, breath from, from trying to talk. And <laughs> yeah, yeah because, because it's a lot. It's a lot. We don't, you know, as dancers, we learn how to use our breath intuitively. And sometimes 
we're holding it and sometimes we're taking deep breaths, but when you have to speak, that's a whole other rhythm of breathing and then you're showing it. I think mm -hmm. there's something similar when you're choreographing too, where you just finish the rehearsal and you're like, like <sighs> just so spent. I'm sure, absolutely. Well, um, let's uh, talk about process a little bit here. Um, I wanted to ask you, are there any specific or, or um, even just sort of general like choreographic tools, I would say, you know, guidelines or rules, sort of self-imposed um, limitations that you use to, to get yourself going? Like Connor, you did the uh, 10 Tiny Dances um, a little while ago, and that's, you know, an obvious um, set of limitations that was put on you, right? Four by four foot by four foot space. Do, you, do any of you ever use anything like that to either get yourself going or get yourself unstuck or anything like that? Um, I'm unmuted, so I'll go first this time. <laughs> um, <laughs> and I was just talking. Um, I would say I didn't want any extra limitations or challenges, especially the first like several years of getting back into choreographing. Although what I think is funny about that is that it always is anyways. There always is some sort of random challenge that presents itself on top of just creating a piece, you know, whether it be an injury and having to sub someone in or something. And um, I'll say the first piece that I did um, with, was actually with Oliver. It wasn't a ballet, but it was for a Michael Jackson tribute, and it was on a it was on a pool deck yeah. that was like these weird dimensions. And so I think kind of like that. Like there's already enough challenges. So maybe I don't know. The first time I have given myself a challenge was most recently for um, Oh There You Are. I like kind of put these little obstacles around the stage and that was challenging. It was challenging with a big cast to navigate around it and try to use it well. And sometimes I think it worked and sometimes it was more like get these things off the stage. <laughs> um, but I don't know that I'm at the point yet where I want to impose more challenges on myself. Um, I just, I, I think that there's enough moving parts that for me it's trying to like, harness each one of those and keep track of them. Like, okay, here's how many people, here's some formations, here's where I'm at in the music. Like structure is incredibly important for me or nothing will happen. Um, yeah. Sure, yeah, that makes sense. I mean, I, I, I go ahead, Ollie. Hit it. I, well, I personally, maybe I'm a little different with Melody in that sense. And, and I think it's perhaps because I feel Melody's work always has a very strong, um, emotional direction or a very strong voice through line for me i feel like i need restrictions to focus myself on something because if not i feel like it's like when you're at the grocery store and you know if the grocery store is too big like you're looking at the cereal aisle and you just become completely overwhelmed like i i prefer a store that's a little smaller there's a little more selected options where i can it helps me pick things out a little bit um so i sort of enjoy either a challenge or a task or something that helps my brain focus me in a little bit or else, at least at this stage um, in my experiences, I, I find the unlimited options completely overwhelming. overwhelming you know, if yeah. the space is too blank and there's too much openness, my brain also becomes completely blank. And you know, so <laughs> I, find, I find I like to have a little um, driver or a little task for myself just to help me stay focused. Um, but I think that as I find my own personal voice or, you know, what I want to say with something, maybe that will change. Um, mm. but that's, that's how I feel these days. A completely blank canvas sometimes is just too, too terrifying. blank, right? Terrifying for me personally, but. Yeah. I yeah, I, I think the, f the first time I've had that was when doing following in the fall. And that was the first time I'd ever had, you know, carte blanche with, dancers and time and and st size of stage and all the things and it's it's overwhelming because up until then it was you have three dancers only two of them are ever going to show up um <laughs> you know and the stage you're is the third one just like on its side and you know all those kind of things you know so but that has always informed what i was going to do i i like melody said you know it, you take those those things and that's how you that's how you make the piece because sure. 
I mean, you do, it, it helps you to have parameters. I've right. never been one to use like um, improvisation techniques or anything like that to make up steps, but I have always relished having um, the, the venue or the, the kind of dancers I have or the sex of the dancers or how much time I'm gonna have. I use all of that to decide how I'm gonna make that piece. When you, when you don't have any of that, it is terrifying. It's almost <laughs> too abstract then. Yeah, because right? it's your, your brain can't grab onto anything. You know, it's like, it's just, it's like this the whole time. And you're like, but please let me know that there is, you know, only one person's ever gonna show up to any rehearsal. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. that's you. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, let's talk about uh, uh, music a little bit in, in, the, in the process here. Um, how do you go about selecting music? Do you find, another way to ask this, I guess, would be, do you ever, you find music and then it just sort of inspires you, I wanna create a dance to that, or does it ever work the other, in reverse, where you have an idea for a dance and then have to go in search of music to sort of serve that idea. What's your you know, typical uh, process like that for creating a piece? Let's uh, start with you, Oliver, since you're already there. Um, all of those things. All of those things, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I've, um, you know, music, music's hard because you always, in, in the ballet field, you always hear, hear this term rights, you know, like, am I going to be able to use the music? So it, it, that does, that does play into how you, it's not just any kind of music you want. I like this music, so I'll use it. Yeah. Right. So you do think about that, but I've had times where I heard music in the car on the radio and I was at Whole Foods cause that's the only place I ever go. And I sat in the car and listened to the whole piece of music cause it immediately grabbed me. And then I figured out what it was and I kind of kept going with that and listened to it again. And I've also had a concept and then kind of figured out what kind of music would, um, would kind of help that concept. So, I mean, I think it all, it depends on the, the day. Yeah, on the day. Very good. What about you, Melody? Oh, sorry, Connor, go ahead. No. Uh, well, I was just gonna say, discovering music is like the most fun and difficult part because I love, personally, when I listen to music, I love listening to new music. I love listening to things I've never heard before. So I love scouring the internet or, you know, you know, back in the day, see people's CD collections or whatever. But like, I love that pursuit of finding new music, you know? But then making a decision is also just awful, you know? And as soon as you've made it, it's both the most relieving decision and terrifying decision. So you're like, oh, finally. And then the next day immediately, you're like, I think I made the wrong decision. But, you know, <laughs> I, I just, I love that journey because I love listening to music and anything that forces me to listen to lots of music is great. So I still think I have a playlist of, from when we were making What We Keep with yeah. Connor and Melody and I are making What We Keep. And I still listen to that music because Connor, I like when people send me all the music. That, that yeah. makes it way easier. We got together and we're trying to figure out what music to use and I was like, I'll go, you know, I'll go on a search and I'll pick that. <laughs> the playlist with like 30 tracks and we didn't use any of them, but I had a blast. <laughs> for anybody that doesn't know, um, for anybody that doesn't know, uh, Connor, uh, Melody and Oliver all created a piece. They collaborated on a piece for Houston Ballet. Um, this was at the GRB, right? The Harvey year, we were a little displaced. Mm -hmm. They created a really, really fantastic piece called What We Keep. Um, so that was really cool. So, but anyway, sorry, go ahead. Connor, it was your, it was your cereal aisle moment. You got to buy all the cereal because we didn't have to submit to any of it. I got to load up the cart and I didn't have to worry about paying. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, what was the question? I, I uh, lost just track. about music and, you know, uh, what comes first, the, you know, the idea or the music, um, how you go about picking music for a piece. I mean, I, I kind of think it can, it's different every time for me. Um, the music's a big driver for me about, you know, what happens in the piece or like what direction I take. But the, the first piece I did um, for our choreographic workshop, I think it was the first one. No, it was the second one, maybe the second one. I was like, I have no idea what I'm going to do. And I, I had a dream 
about um, these these women who were also trees. <laughs> there were three of them, and I was like, great. And so I just like had this visual in my head and ended up kind of doing choreography first and then fitting some music to what we were making based on these visuals I had. And so the music came after. Um, and that was the first time for me that happened. Um, but it, I think the music can't come too far after for me because it, it does drive a lot um, mm -hmm. of the piece. But it, I don't, yeah, it depends. Sometimes I'll hear a piece of music, kind of like what was already said, and I'll just be like, oh, I want to use this, or I'll hear several pieces and I kind of want to put them together. Mm -hmm. um, so I don't, it's not set in stone for me. I guess I like the cereal aisle, Connor. Yeah. <laughs> I guess I like <laughs> Lots of all options. the things, all the options. You're much more, you're much more comfortable there than I am, yeah. <laughs> I don't need That's not, it doesn't always turn out well. There's no better, there's no better option. It's so funny. We learned when we collaborated that all three of us have very different, I wouldn't even say strengths, but different instincts about like how to move into something creative. And it, so it was really fun to learn from each other. But yeah, we, we all three are like very different in, how, in our, how we get there sometimes, which is fun. Very cool. Interesting. Um, well, sticking with music, I just wanted, I was just wondering, do you guys ever, do you remember the first piece of music that you ever really fell in love with, whether it was as a kid or growing up or something that sticks in your mind that you ever, that really, really, really grabbed you from an early age? You mean besides Britney Spears' <laughs> first album, no. Hit Me Baby, One it More could Time? Be, it could be that. <laughs> Whatever hooks you, hooks you. I mean, I, this is cheesy, but I, I do remember um, being in Miami City Ballet School and being backstage during the Nutcracker and just going kind of gaga for the grandpa in, in the Nutcracker. I've always, I always said that like the first thing I'd choreograph is Tchaikovsky and I've never choreographed to Tchaikovsky because I think I'm, I don't think I can. It's just, it's too good. Um, but I think it, it was that. It was that, yeah. Cool. What about you, Connor? Uh, you know, I don't know. I, it's tough. It's like, do, is it my first, the first cassette tape I owned, or is it the first, right. like, the first band that I love? I don't, you know, when I was a young kid, I listened to like a lot of alternative music, and so that was more, it was equally like a, as much of an energy and an emotion. Uh, sure. Or like, or like an identity, like it had so much to do with style and what they were talking about and what spoke to me. Um, I remember like my first favorite band was the Wallflowers. It was Jacob Dylan, Bob Dylan's son, and I, I like loved that stuff. <laughs> but I, I remember the first piece of classical music that really took my breath away, that really kind of opened my eyes of like how emotionally powerful it could be. It was the first time I saw Serenade, Balanchine Serenade. And that, you know, it was like a moment where the music could just be so powerful, where all those beautiful dancers are just standing plainly on stage. And those mm -hmm. strings are just like, bleeding with emotion. Um, yeah, I, that was a kind of eye-opening moment for me as far as changing my palette towards music and how music and dance could go together. Um, I think until that, I was sort of distracted with technical elements of dance, you know what I mean? Like the, um, or like the theatrical part of it. And that was, a, I remember that as a real moment where my eyes were open to um, the power of music and orchestra. Powerful that was when it kind of came together there. Yeah, well, when the dancers were doing nothing and the music was gushing, you know? Um, but that, you know, I was a late teenager then, so. Sure. No, but still, that's a, uh, yeah. Big moment. What about you? Yeah. <laughs> what about you, Melody? Anything sticks out? Um, yeah, I, it's, it's hard. The first thing that popped into my head was um, Andrea Bocelli. And I, I think that like what kind of strings through for me are like voices. I, you know, I grew up with folk music. My parents really loved a lot of like old hippie folk music um, that I couldn't even tell you who half the artists were playing their guitar and singing these like poems. Um, and my, my whole family played a lot of music growing up. So music feels like people and community to me. Um, so classical music, it's not really different from that. Like I, I really feel that with like uh, instruments like cello and strings. And then I, I like 
percussion as well, but sometimes I struggle with parts of, of like classical music, like horns and things that I'm just like, that. Ah, like I want it to feel like <laughs> more a little like a bit voice, more huh? like, like a human voice. And I guess that's just my preference, but yeah, I, I loved his voice. My, you know, my dad listened to Andre Bocelli um, when I was like, probably right before I left to come to Houston. And I, I still can like get really teary, like listening to those songs just because there's something really beautiful about it. So that's what popped into my head. Yeah. Absolutely. What about, um, what about choreography? Any uh, pieces that you remember um, really grabbing you when you were younger, even if, you know, didn't obviously didn't make you say I want to be a choreographer, but something you uh, petite mort. Petite, I'm I'm petite right there mort. with you. I on mean, that. Yeah, I think it was the first time. Yeah, I got to see a a, a VHS. That's what I saw <laughs> of, too. of it. Um, Early nineties. Yeah, I just was like stopped in my tracks. I mean, I had never seen anything like that. Um, the the dancers, the articulation of their bodies and like what they were doing and the precision of like that sword part in silence, it just blew me away. Um, it really made me want to be a professional dancer more than I like had been to that point as well. I mean, I loved it and I was doing it, but I was like, that's what I want to do. Um, that, that will always like be one of my favorites. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. What about you, uh, Oliver? Um, I mean, I think, when I, when I was in San Francisco Ballet School, and at the time, uh, Helgi, who was, Helgi Thomason, who was the director, was putting on a lot of new work. And, um, you know, I had come from Miami City Ballet, which was very Balanchine. And at the time, um, their budget was like $3. So they did the same five Balanchine ballets every year. So it was, it was great and I loved them, but it was all I saw. So coming to San Francisco and then all of a, seeing, uh, all of a sudden seeing work by, new work by Mark Morris and, and kind of up and, and, and uh, William Forsyth and then like new people like Julia Adam and Yuri Pazikov. I think in, see, um, in seeing that in it looking new to me and different from what I knew, um, I think definitely has informed how I approach choreography now, um, mm -hmm. somehow, you know, just like wanting it, wanting to be something different, you know, different. Not, um, and I've lost my train of thought. <laughs> <laughs> so you didn't want, you don't want to remake Balanchine Ballets? I mean, I do, but I can't. <laughs> well, it yeah. Is, so good and if I Genius. could I would but um no it was I just I, it was a cool time to see all these kind of new new ballets that that were all different you know Mark Morris is very different from William Forsyth who's different very. from um Paul Taylor and and you know all the all the things that I was seeing and I was like wow there's so much available you know mm -hmm. and you can do so much with just dance because these were all um, sort of abstract pieces without a lot of set and it was just dance and that really affected me because that was my upbringing was seeing abstract dance it wasn't kind of uh, big story ballets um, and I and I liked that um, so that played a part in my <laughs> yeah very cool what about you Connor um yeah I mean I don't really know where to go with that I mean, it's I remember when I first came to Houston, it was a big eye opener just because it was the first time I came to a school where I could watch a company, right? And so immediately in my first year, just seeing ballets like Menon, like I had never seen anything like that. Something so theatrical that took the teenage out of, teenager out of me that just wanted to see a guy do big double tours, you know, and say, whoa, like ballet can be so much. And then also, you know, early on I saw about like Christopher Bruce's ghost dances was really impactful to me. Um, they did that when I was in this, the company did that when I was in the school here and that was kind of a whoa. Of course, we all, I went home and watched that DVD over and over and over again after sure. that. <laughs> they burnt the hole through it. Um, but yeah, I, there's also a lot of ballets. I, I remember Dance Salad has been a big eye opener to me, a dance festival in town where we've gotten to see a lot of, been exposed to a lot of dance and I remember I saw a David Dawson work called The Gray Area there, and that was a big, another big eye-opener to me. 
um, at that point I had not really seen any Forsyth and I had, I had not been exposed to um, much European dance and their sort of aesthetic and style of moving. So I remember that piece. I haven't, and I'm not sure I've seen it in a very long time. So I'd love to watch it again and see if it still speaks or excites me. Um, mm. I remember that being a wow moment of what I thought dance and ballet could be um, uh, for choreographers. Um, so that, that one particularly stood out for me. Very cool. Um, let me see here, where are we? Oh yes, okay, so let me talk a little bit more about the, um, the process here, I'll ask you guys. Do you ever, <laughs> so getting into the studio, you have an idea, you start going. Do you ever doubt yourself or your direction that you're going at any point during the process and how do you deal with that? Is it just to, you know, power through and see how it goes or what did, what's that sort of internal journey like? Because it's a very, um, vulnerable thing to do, right? To create a piece more so than dancing to, I think anyways. So I'd imagine that there's a lot of, uh, a lot that goes on in, inside when you're trying to create something. Yeah. It feels like you got the little birdie saying what you're doing is very important. And you've got the other birdie saying that is horrible. And they <laughs> are going back and forth. Right. That's how I feel. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. You just Which shut one out and listen to the yeah. other. I, let, I keep listening to the one who says you're doing important. You're great. It's looking great. Yeah. It's probably uh, a good plan. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I, when I first choreographed, and this is probably in a, you know, in a workshop, I was in my early 20s. I thought, I, I would always say to my friends, I said, it feels like you're letting somebody read your diary. That's what it feels like. You're like, this is how I move on the inside. This is what I think. This is how I feel when I listen to this music um you know it just felt like you were letting somebody in on your deepest darkest secrets like your most vulnerable thing looking back at the work it wasn't at all that right like there, i wasn't even putting that much of myself into it as far as like a personal narrative but it, it does it's that revealing it feels like that revealing of an experience and sure. um yeah i think part of that getting over that or at least that's a i think it's an endless fight and I think like people like Stanton, who I think we're all fortunate to have in our lives who can say like, yeah, it's awful, it's hard. It's endlessly hard. Like people who have been doing it their whole lives who still say it's hard, I think is really helpful. Like I remember Mark Morris, who we think is this, you know, iconic choreographer who is so, it's so easy. I remember watching him have moments where he struggled so hard. And I think that that was really um, empowering to me to say, oh wow, these people who have been doing it for 30, 40 years, they still find it hard. And if they still find it hard, like that's just something you have to deal with. That's not me. Right. It's not a me problem. That's just the difficulty of choreographing. And you just gotta, you and gotta- Being human and- Yeah, I mean, maybe you get more comfortable with it, hopefully, but right. you find ways to cope and all that. But it's, Yeah, that's helpful. Yeah, if you see that they, they struggle with the same things, but they still continue to produce and make these amazing ballets, then, then you yeah, can too, right? It's just part of the process that you have to be willing. And I think it's, for me, just, I have to always rem remind myself of that nowadays and be like, oh no, even the greats struggle. And like, you're just beginning. Like, you're just starting to figure out how to do anything. Right, keep okay. going, yeah. It's okay that this feels awful <laughs> <laughs> or terrifying because like to get to the reward, you know, the reward is, you never know when the rewards in a process are coming. Sometimes they sneak up on you. Sometimes it's not till the end. Sometimes it's, you know, here or there. So, um, yeah, just trusting that they will come. Right. Trusting. I think that's, that's probably the main thing too, right? Just trusting yourself, your instinct, your, you know, ability and your, uh, um, idea and following yeah. that through, I guess. And also being willing to let, let something go. I mean, it's hard when, I've had times where I've worked on something for a really long time and then you, you, you see that it's not working and you, and, but you feel bad for these dancers who have been really putting in the time they've been lifting, you know, they've done that lift 30 times and then you, you know that that, it just doesn't work. And so being able or, you know, saying, I got to cut that, gotta scrap or, that or feeling so bad that you don't cut it. Cause it's just done so many times. Um, but yeah, that's hard. Yeah, I want to quickly, there's a guy named Mario Zambrano, who's a choreographer and also an author. And I remember listening to an interview with him 
after he wrote a book and saying, what was so difficult about choreographing is the investment of the dancers. That with writing, you can write something and you can crumple, crumple up the page and throw it out. You can say, you know, I don't like it, it's okay. But with dancers, you have people who've invested sweat, blood and tears and all of it into it. So there's like an equal ownership to the works and you can't just, it's really hard to snip it as Oliver's saying, you know, it's hard to just be like, sorry, it doesn't work, you know. It doesn't I mean, affect just you, right? Yeah. yeah, you have to sometimes, but that's a real, that's a real challenge. I think where I, I started before choreography, I started working with like video and, you know, editing my little videos together. And I had the ability to sit at my computer and, and play around and cut and paste and add the filter and add this for as long as I wanted. And it wasn't affecting anyone. Mm -hmm. And with, with working with live bodies, yeah. for me, and not all, some choreographers can be like, you're going to do this over and over and over again until we get it. And, and you understand that as a dancer, but I've, right. never, That's been what I was say. I've never been able to do that. I, 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 maybe because I'm still a dancer and I, I feel for the dancer and I know that it's hurting and I know that you're tired but it's, that's a very hard place for me to, to be like, I need to see it again. Uh, I struggle with that. You see that dancer stretching out their back, you know, they're yeah. like, they're you go, are you okay? Are you okay? <laughs> no? Yeah, I was going to say, you're probably all uh, hypersensitive, you know, because no, you are still- If someone dancer. does like a little bit of, uh, you know, like grabs like this, like Jessica Colada will really do this. Uh -huh. <laughs> oh my God, you threw out your neck. You got to go, leave, you know, it's, you, you feel bad, but you, you need to see it over and over it to understand it or understand if it works or. Right. But as a dancer, you get, you know, you get that. That's part of, that's part yeah. of the deal. Yeah. You know? yeah. As a dancer, you want to get it. You want to be yeah, helpful. Sure. With that. Yeah. yeah. You'll be happy at the end, regardless of how much it hurts. You'll be happy if you succeed and you make something. You get that. It's all worth it. Yeah. It's hard to remember that on, on the flip side. The other side. Oliver, I feel like you know when I'm hurt before I know. Like oh, yeah. in one you of the rehearsals. Good, uh, you'll melody, like, uh, like, you hurt yourself. Stop. Please stop. <laughs> you hurt? Sit down. We'll just talk <laughs> about it. <laughs> you'll be like, are you okay? Just mark yeah. it. And I'm like, I'm fine. Yeah. <laughs> and then five minutes later, I'm like, ow. <laughs> That's funny. Um, yeah, just what they already said. I, um, I think that one thing that choreography has helped me learn how to do is to pause um, and to be okay with nothing. And I really wasn't like, that would make me sweat in the beginning. Like, oh my God, <laughs> losing my train of thought or not having a step or, you know, just that like moment of silence. Oh, it would like make me crazy. And I would just come up, try to do something or like try to like muscle through it um and feel like i was failing and feel like i was you know whatever pineapple on my head like that i was just making a fool of myself um and i just think over time like I, i've even watched choreographers that i think are the best just sit there sometimes like the person who does it the most you guys is your my eels <laughs> it's like i have never experienced anything <laughs> like that i swear when we when he choreographed one and one it was minutes sometimes of him just kind of like in his head, total silence. And you're like, should I, should I leave? Is he okay? Like, you know. Is he, fro is he frozen in on Zoom? <laughs> is, <did> he, <laughs> he was the original frozen on Zoom, yeah. but not in Zoom. But as a dancer, you kind of appreciate that choreographer. You're like, thank God I can breathe for a second and get a glass of water. You know, it's right, right. the choreographer who is like constant, and you're, you're just like, please let me just take a breath, you know? Like, I love Or you can go over it. Yeah. Yeah, let me Like, you, like you can go it. over it so you don't have to fake, like, okay, yeah, do it again. I don't really know it yet, but I'll fake Remember it. Remember, now I'm making something up. Learn yeah. It. yeah, but I mean, so I think for me, it's, it's taught me to be more comfortable with pausing and having just space or silence. And like, like Oliver, well, both Oliver and Connor said, just sometimes walking away from it and being mm -hmm. like, that's all I got today. You know, and kind of being okay with that. Um, and the other thing I think that that has taught me how to do is like, I like to be really collaborative with the dancers. And sometimes that kind of block is happening because I need them to do something. Like I need them to give me a cue, even if it's just with their body. Like if they get stuck in some awkward thing that I made, 
what what do they do next you know do they go this way do they want to go this way like i need sometimes their own bodies to inform what happens more naturally because in my head or what i worked out is like blocked and stuck um and so those are the two things is like learning to listen to them even if it's listening you know to like what their bodies want to do and just stopping sometimes yeah because you, i'm sure you think you know okay well i've got you know two hours here to choreograph and i'm just going to choreograph for two hours but right. that sort of creative process doesn't really work that well, way can you imagine yeah. doing a painting and being like well people do timed paintings right but like doing a painting and being like oh i'll just put something here just put some <laughs> i'll just like splatter some of that there i mean there are techniques like that but sometimes you probably have to just step back and like take it in and i think it's the same just having a bunch of people waiting for you to paint is really difficult you know and it, yes. it, it makes the process of trying to be productive very difficult you yeah. know right melody that silence even if that silence is only three seconds like it getting, feels like it feels you know it's it's uh, magnified it, but getting comfortable with those little moments of thought while you have a bunch of people just staring at you waiting for direction while you're trying to not just direct the rehearsal but also trying to create that is i think the endless fight and uh, you're so right on now well that goes back to what we were talking about clock. sorry what's that <laughs> sorry right, always aware of that clock i mean there's not a lot of artists who have to kind of always be cognizant of the ticking clock um, that you, you yeah. have an hour it's like you don't know when when the um the inspiration is going to hit in that hour and if it hits at 50 minutes then mm -hmm. you're like well i just got started you right. know it's that that's a that's a struggle with choreography i think is is that time you know it's just dancers yeah. aren't free you know you have to it's 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 an expense to create it's difficult yeah. It's a business, yeah. yeah. There's always that side of it. And there's so many factors that go into, like you said, when's that inspiration gonna hit, you know? The, the movement of the dancer or just an idea that pops into your head, something you see, so, yeah, I guess you never yeah, know. Yeah, right? it never works out that you walk in and your rehearsal starts at 1.45 and at 1.46 you're flowing, you know? <laughs> right. You know, yeah. it's like 1.47, nothing's happened, 1.48, worse things have happened, you know? Like, <laughs> and then at 2.30 you're like, oh, Oh, okay, I get it, and then it's over at two forty-five. Right. You know, it's. I mean, but I, that is. I mean, that's part of the the deal, and that's you know what you work with. Well, then uh, let's see how how has uh, choreographing influenced or um, altered your perspective on dancing, or even if it's just you know your how you relate to to another choreographer in the room. Has that has that uh, changed at all uh, that you've noticed since you began choreographing? Oliver, do you have anything? Um, to add? Whoever, <laughs> whoever wants to go, go. <laughs> um, yes, I, I don't know how. I just think I'm I'm more aware of all all of it. You know, I I feel like now I see more of what the guy in the front of the room is thinking. So I'm I'm aware of that um, as a dancer. I'm more willing to try things. I'm more. I'm just aware of what he or she needs from me. Uh, before I was a little bit that dancer who waited and I was like, yeah, I got it. I, you, you tell me when you're ready, I'll, I'll come do through. Something. I'll, I'll be able to do that, you know? But now I, I know that it's, it's not just, you know, it's, it's collaborative. Uh, let's, you know, not use that word too much, but it, it is collaborative, you know? So um, I'm aware of all that. I don't know if that's made me better, but that's. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's helped me to understand my identity as a dancer more because, and like what, what I bring to, to a room, like when I'm being choreographed on, um, because working with different dancers and like working with their different qualities is kind of what like reflects that back for me where I'm like, oh, like, you'll have a dancer who's like incredibly self-responsible, right? But right. they might not be as malleable, like, right. which is wonderful because they're gonna walk in, they're gonna know it, it's gonna be crisp or whatever. And it's like, I have no, I know what I'm gonna get. And then I have a dancer that like 
scares the crap out of me, comes to only some of the rehearsals, and I have no idea what's gonna happen. And then when they get on stage, I'm like, whoa, like, it's just everybody is so different, but how that feeds into the process, you know, the creative process, is just like, it's just a lot of learning. I, I don't mean to say any of that with judgment. It probably sounded a little judgy, but it is like, people are just very different. I think I would have said before, like, oh, this one over here, the one who's self-responsible and honestly, like more rigid is better, right? Like that's a better person to work with. And to be honest, that's not always the case um, because I might only be able to go so far with this person. And so it's interesting how we are, I can't get away from this canvas of colors, you know? I, it's interesting how we are as a company, very colorful and we need these reds and we need these blues and we're all pretty different in our approaches, but it's nice to, to be able to have all of that variety. And so I think as a dancer myself, I can get pretty like low on myself about like m maybe my qualities or what's innate for me isn't good or it isn't as good as this. Like that's just been a mindset that's been easy for me to fall into. And while I think we're all seeking balance, you know, like if I'm over here, maybe I wanna, you know, make myself out of my comfort zone a little more each time. And if I'm over here, maybe I need to like set an alarm, <laughs> you know, or something. <laughs> but, um, but for me, it helps me because it puts perspective to like, oh, like this is who I am as a dancer. And I can look at that more honestly and go, now I know what that's like from the other side of the room. I know what's really nice about it and I know what's hard about it. Um, and so I think it helps me to be, to have more choice in like my dancing and the kind of dancer that I am, um, at least hopefully sometimes. It's your different awareness of your, of yourself, right? Yeah, that's, that's yeah. a wonderful point, Mel. I mean, I, I've definitely just even, you kind of get that even just a little bit, the longer you're in a company, the more you learn how much everybody has something to bring to the table, right? And I, right. When, when you try and choreograph on dancers, oh, it, it definitely reveals so much about who they are and what they have. I think that's such a beautiful point. But I, I just adding to that question is that I think for me, it's like trying to, in a way, there's like a trying to keep judgment out of the room. Because as a dancer, you like you're so invested and you want the best thing product, product to come out there. And, and it's so difficult sometimes when somebody says, you know, can you do this to like, not censor your reaction, but like be very sensitive to how much courage it took for a choreographer to come up and, and say, hey, will you try this crazy idea? Because I, you know, like, I don't know if it's a good idea or not until you try it. Right. And it, I feel like dancers have the power to really support choreographers and really participate and really elevate the work, or they can also make choreographers go into their shell and, um, make the work worse just by, um, you know, bringing judgment or second guessing their idea or like not being sensitive to, just to the fact that it took courage for them to even suggest it. Right. You know, and I, I, so I, I've tried to bring that to my work. It's, I'm definitely not perfect at it. You know, we all have emotions and sometimes people ask you to do crazy stuff and it's hard to not like, sometimes your thoughts just, Go across your face. <laughs> yeah, but, you know, I always try and collect myself and go, okay, wait, you don't know. You don't know where this right, is going to go, try. how this is going to end up. So I think it's definitely, choreographing has definitely made me um, a more well-rounded dancer and a more, I think a more helpful dancer. At least I hope so, because, you know, I have a lot of admiration for people who try and get in front of the room and make stuff. Hmm. I think Maybe that's more the, available, huh? Try, yeah. try. Yeah. The, the big thing that you're saying, um, is that, I mean, for me, choreography is like a game. Like we all went in to the studio and we're playing and mm -hmm. everyone has to participate. You know, if you have someone who's not participating, then, then the game's no fun or it doesn't work. So I, I think that's what I've learned as a dancer is every day you've got to go in and you've got to participate. You know, it, whether you're in a good mood that day or where, whether you're hurting that day, you've got to be um, willing to be participatory. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, well, I have a couple of uh, audience uh, submitted questions here too. So let me uh, just go through a couple of these. Uh, do you like to choreograph in the performance's exact order or do you prefer to create sequences and then group them together in whichever order you'd like most? 
I read that for verbatim there. Does that, that make sense? Yeah, I think I would love to have like uh, a structure of how things were going to go and, and just be able to go from beginning to Start end. Start the beginning, go to the middle, finish. Yeah. I think sometimes I only know what's going to happen here. <laughs> so you start where you know and you sometimes uh -huh. you build out. Um, but if you're choreographing on a company, you have to deal with rehearsal schedules and who's available. So you, you have to be, um, you, you know, the company, when somebody's creating work, they try and always give that choreographer priority, but the choreographer right. has to be flexible with what dancers they have available because the company's putting on not just one ballet, they're putting on a season of dance. Um, so I think, you know, the choreographers, at least I'll have to learn as I try and do more dance that to learn how to create whatever is needed and whatever I can in that moment. Mm -hmm. yeah. I agree. What about you guys? <laughs> you agree. <laughs> I agree with everything Connor said. Well, it's like those limitations, recorded right? They're kind of. I want that for on. I want that on record. <laughs> it is recorded somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> Gonna make a little uh, a gif out of that or something. Yeah. <laughs> Um, it's like, yeah, those limitations that we talked about, but sometimes they're just part of the deal, right? You have a group of dancers that are not next in, in the sequence of the actual piece, but there you have for the next rehearsal, so you have to get, you have to get started, right? There's always that place in the music that you hate, and you just keep skipping it. You put it off. <laughs> Even if you ha it's a story and you have to tell it, you know, you have to work, you know, linearly, linearly there's always the place that you're like, mm, the and a yada yada that part, right? Yeah. We hope it <laughs> reveals a big blackout in the. <laughs> <laughs> uh, let's see what else do we have. Um, uh, do you believe any additional training beyond dance training is necessary and or helpful to be a successful choreographer? Like, would you like to have have had some uh, choreographic training? You know. And I know that there are there are schools for choreography and there, things like that. Feel like that would be. There's like no there's no training for choreographers. There's I mean, there is there there is, but a, a lot of the choreographers that work in classical ballet companies, by osmosis, became a choreographer. Right. <laughs> you know, which is which makes you feel like you did you didn't go to school for something, and then you're just um, you're making it all up, which you are. <laughs> you know, but <laughs> but um, I think that we should be taught more music in school. I think music should be your teacher. I don't think enough music is being taught to ballet dancers. Yeah, I would agree with that. And I think that helps yeah. you, know, if you want to become a ballet master if you want anything, you know. Well, like, music and dance have so many similarities too, right? So yeah, I mean, learning I, I, one helps you with the other, yeah. Yeah. yeah, I agree with what Oliver said. I think um, I was exposed to a lot of music growing up and like learned instruments and stuff just a little bit here and there from different like people. But what helped me a lot, I think, with specifically with choreography was this weird class that I took randomly um, that my ballet school offered because they had this guy that played the piano for us that was just kind of amazing. And he taught a rhythmic notation class. And um, so we learned to read rhythm. Um, so instead of like learning to read music, we could read rhythmic notation. And so we did this like fugue at the end of the year and he got really sick and I ended up conducting it. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, of course, Torchete, Torchete, and I'll be a conductor too. Like, conduct, let me conduct. do it. Um, but, but the, you know, the rhythm is something that I feel like as choreographers, we struggle to communicate it sometimes, like especially with like, I'll, I'll use Oliver as an example because I've danced in your pieces. Like you all have these really like syncopated sort of rhythms that just come out and sometimes it's hard to explain it, you know, or to like communicate it or get it across. Like you show it and the dancer's like, like this? And it's like, not quite. <laughs> but I do feel like the more that we're sort of exposed to that and train our ears for that. Some people have it supernaturally, but some people don't. I think it helps um, that communication line of like, oh, this is the rhythm that I, I'm doing this in. And it's like, oh, we're on the same page a little more. Maybe. Yeah. 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 I mean, I would just tag on the end there. I mean, I don't think that 
there, there is no right or wrong way. I mean, that's something that I'm trying to come to terms with myself. Like there is no way that right. singular there, way. There, yeah. there are methods and tools and things like that. And I think if you go to college or university and study choreography, I think that's part of what you're going to learn. You're right. going to learn tools, but you're not going to learn that there is one way. One way to do it. Uh, but I just think that when I look at choreographers that I admire, they are um, well-rounded and well-read, and they expose themselves to not just one, not just dance, to many art forms. And I think that that you know whether it's music, whether it's they go to museums, whether they um, go to all sorts of theater. Um, I think that that's so important. The work that I want to be a part of is inspired by life as lots a whole. of different things, right? just like cool dance steps, you know? Um, so I think the broader of information people absorb, the more they have to bring to the table. Yeah, makes sense. Um, let me see, uh, how are we doing on time there, Kelly? I think we could probably do one more question and then wrap it up. Okay, um, I'll have to ask this, this is a good one here. Uh, choreography in the time of COVID E.g., how can we get the whole world dancing down the street like Oliver? That's what I want to know, too. <laughs> what do you say? Um, do I answer that? I think you answer that, yeah. <laughs> you put on little running, orange running shorts, and you put on okay. a good song, and you chasse. Just chasse. Yeah. All right. I think, um, listen to good music, and you're going to want to chasse. <laughs> I have no um, other <laughs> words of wisdom there <laughs> for COVID, except, um, I don't know. I think everyone can be a choreographer. I think listen to music and like dance, and then you became a choreographer. There you go. That's it. Now's the time to play around because, you know, yeah. no one's watching. Yeah. Right. No one's watching. <laughs> fill, up your, fill up your iPhone memory with all the videos of yourself doing choreography. And who knows? Maybe you become a choreographer. Maybe Send it to Houston Ballet. Sorry, Kelly. <laughs> <laughs> you get an influx of, you know, iPhone videos. That's fine. I can't wait. We look forward <laughs> to your choreography. Lots of orange I shorts. actually would love that project. I think we should do that project. I think people should send in clips and we should make a piece out of it. All right. I will not be in Different charge of that <laughs> Are you taking lead on that one? <laughs> no. Yeah, you have to watch all of them. Yeah. <laughs> well, I think that might wrap up our conversation uh, for tonight. I, I want to say a big thank you to Ian and to Carmel and Oliver. Thank you. Uh, it's so fantastic hearing your thoughts uh, and, and having Ian lead this conversation, uh, this dancer perspective. Um, and then I want to thank all of you for joining us tonight. Um, we are so um, thrilled that you're continuing to support us and we get to see your faces and connect with you. Um, and we're thrilled to do it over this digital form and hopefully someday in the near, not too near, not too distant future, we'll see you back again in the theater, but we appreciate your support. We hope you are safe and healthy and um, stay connected with us. We look forward to seeing you again soon. Have a great night.